LinkedIn presents. I'm Rufus Griscom, and this is The Next Big Idea. Today, how did the first people arrive in the Americas? Sometimes when I'm ordering Thai food on my electric scooter, I catch myself daydreaming about what it was like to be a member of an ancient nomadic tribe. Imagine fishing, hunting, tracking animals, exploring new lands, with all the intelligence of modern humans applied not to wordle or zoom lighting, but rather to reading the tracks of animals and the subtleties of paw prints and the bends in the grass, to building outrigger canoes with handcrafted axes, and then crossing oceans. For most of the last 300,000 years, this was how humans lived. Today, if you were to dress me, you, and a dozen friends in loincloths and drop us off at the woods, how long would we last? Not long at all. I can't even begin to imagine how poorly we would have fared 15,000 years ago when those woods were populated by dire wolves and mastodons and cave bears. It's no wonder then that many of us, when we stop to think about the skills required of our Ice Age forebears, can't help but feel a sense of awe. And it's because of that awe that for hundreds of years now, we have been gradually piecing together a history of our species, developing a picture that is nothing short of extraordinary. The first anatomically modern humans emerged in Africa around 300,000 years ago. About 210,000 years ago, some of them traveled to Greece. Over the next few millennia, some made it to Israel and China. And then, about 70,000 years ago, a larger collection of early humans got antsy and headed off in droves to explore the world. They spread out through Europe and Asia. They encountered other human species, Denisovans and Neanderthals. They built boats and sailed to Australia. And some moved into the then uninhabited Americas. We pieced this remarkable legacy together using a few tools oral history, archaeology, linguistics, and recently, genetics. But there is still much we don't know. Fortunately, a new generation of scholars is rapidly producing answers. One such scholar is the archaeologist David Wengro, who, along with the late David Graeber, made headlines and bestseller lists last winter with their book, The Dawn of Everything, which presents astonishing evidence of the vast scale, political ingenuity, and technological sophistication of early human settlements. When I spoke to David on this show back in December, he told me his book was inspired by the desire to show how these new findings could shake up, quote, some of our most entrenched ideas about what our species is and what our capacities are. The dawn of everything, he added, has walked into that void. Now another book has walked into that void, and it too has made headlines and bestseller lists. The book is Origin, A Genetic History of the Americas, and it was written by a University of Kansas professor named Jennifer Raff. In the book, Jennifer takes on a question that has vexed her field for centuries. When and how and why did humans migrate to the Americas? For decades, archaeologists answered that question like this. Around 13,000 years ago, small bands of hunters living in Siberia followed mammoths and other giant beasts across a land bridge into Alaska. They tried to move south, but were thwarted by an ice wall that was two miles tall and stretched from coast to coast. Eventually, though, the ice wall began to melt and a passable corridor opened up along the Rocky Mountains. People raced southward then, and within a few thousand years, their descendants could be found throughout North and South America. If you took an archaeology class sometime in the last 50 years, you probably heard a version of that story. And you should ask for your money back. Because in origin, Jennifer says, that's not really what happened at all. The first peoples didn't race down a treacherous ice corridor. Instead, she says, they most likely traveled along the West Coast by boat. And they didn't do this 13,000 years ago. They made their move 20 or 25 or maybe even 30,000 years ago. These distinctions may seem like minor quibbles, but the implications here are profound. It means that researchers need to construct an entirely new narrative about the peopling of the Americas. 
It also reaffirms the origin stories of numerous indigenous peoples who have long maintained that they descend from seafarers. And if the implications are profound, so is the science behind them. In her lab, Jennifer is able to extract viable DNA from shards of bones and teeth and strands of hair that are thousands of years old. She and other paleogeneticists can then compare the DNA signatures of samples gathered all over the country to create detailed genetic histories. One of the things I loved about speaking with Jennifer is that she manages to make the distant past feel blazingly alive. She reminds me of the great Faulkner line, the past is never dead, it's not even past. If you're interested in the story behind the business headlines, check out Big Technology Podcast, my weekly show that features in-depth interviews with CEOs, researchers, and reformers in business and technology. Hi, I'm Alex Kantrowitz. I'm a longtime journalist, CNBC contributor, and the host of the show. I empty my Rolodex every Wednesday to bring you awesome episodes, so go check out Big Technology Podcast. It's available on all podcast apps. We'd love to have you as a listener. Jennifer Raff, welcome to the Next Big Idea podcast. Thank you so much. I'm so honored to be on your podcast. Jennifer, you begin your wonderful new book, Origin, with a land acknowledgement statement. This book you write was written on land taken from the Kaw, Osage, and Shawnee nations. Uh, so I thought I'd start our conversation by sharing with you that I'm speaking to you from our home, which sits on land that once belonged to the Montauket tribe in Long Island. That's a really important and meaningful way, I think, to start a lot of these kinds of conversations by uh, acknowledging the history that predates European contact and then also the history of really troubled relationships uh, and colonialism that, that occurred since Europeans have gotten here. It's certainly a start anyway to begin the conversation. Um, and what we do with that knowledge then is, is up to us. And it's, it's also important. Absolutely. Well, Jennifer, when, when Caleb, our producer, first suggested having you on the show, I immediately said, oh my gosh, this is one of my favorite topics in the world. I've literally read every article that I've encountered the last 20 years on the topic. But I asked Caleb, do you think the broader audience will be into this? And he said, Rufus, Origin is on the New York Times bestseller list. And I immediately thought to myself, that is wonderful. It's so great to see. It gives me hope for our species. I love that your book has generated so much interest and, and it's well-deserved. It's an incredible work of scholarship and research and compassion. So first I wanna say congratulations. I also wanna ask, were you surprised by the book's success? Oh yes, I still haven't quite grasped it, <laughs> if I'm being honest. I, um, it's been kind of a fog since, I've been in a fog since February, really trying to wrap my brain around this. Um, I did not expect it would do this well. I was hoping maybe it would you know, do well in one of the sub sub categories on Amazon, but uh, this really blew past any expectation or hope that I might have had. I'm really grateful. Well, and it seems, do you think it has something to do with this kind of deep curiosity that we all have about our origin story, about where where we came from? It seems it seems to be a pretty kind of deeply primal interest we all have. Yeah, I think that's a big part of it. I think that. People are very, very curious about history, especially about very ancient history. And I think that there is a lot out there on the subject, both good and bad, right? There, there's a whole media ecosystem of terrible, terrible history, uh, yeah, alternative yeah. history, right? And, you know, I think that its popularity speaks to um, a genuine curiosity that people have to be connected to the past and to understand the past. And I just was really hoping that some of the history that's more scientifically informed could could be presented as an alternative um, uh, in that landscape. And it seems to be that there is an appetite for this. And that that makes me really, I'm really encouraged by that. Yeah, no, it, it's great to see. I, I think there are two reasons why I have always been drawn to this subject matter. The first is that the story of our species it's just, it's so remarkable that we survived against the odds. I mean, obviously, like the ascension of, of Homo sapiens is a mixed bag, right? We, we haven't necessarily had the best impact on the planet. There are complications. But the early part of our story 
is kind of beautiful and and a story of 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 survival against a lot of a, a lot of challenges. The second thing I find so extraordinary is that it's the most extraordinary detective story, right? Of, of trying to trying to piece together how we emerged. And, and we have these four tools at our disposal. We have archaeology, linguistics, the oral tradition of descendants that you speak about. And most recently, and maybe most powerfully, genetics, which is your area of expertise, uh, and it, it's such a, a fast-moving uh, and extraordinary process of, of trying to figure it all out. Yeah, it is, and I got to say that the pace of new findings in this field, new research, is so fast. It's really hard for me to keep up with it. Let alone, I'm sure the uh, you know a non-specialist who just happens to be curious about this and one of my hopes in writing this book and you know maybe books in the future is is to inform myself as much as anybody else about what is out there what do we know where are the um the areas that are on less solid ground right the active areas of research what can we learn from genetics that we can't learn from archaeology or oral mm -hmm. traditions and vice versa i think all these different lines of evidence are complementary and they're all important um, but they give us different insights into the past and my maybe overly ambitious task in this in this book was to try to bring together as many different lines of evidence as I could to just answer that one question. Well, your 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 book Origin tells the story of the peopling of the Americas. But I wonder if we might take a step back and talk for a minute about the origin of our species from the beginning, which you do touch on in the book. So I here I I'm going to share with you my understanding and then and then if you could correct it, <laughs> that would be great. Um as I understand it, Homo erectus, our, our our ancestors, emerged about two million years ago in Africa, gradually developed into several archaic human species, including Neanderthals, Denisovans, who appear to have left Africa a few hundred thousand years ago. We then started migrating out of Africa, I think about a hundred thousand years ago, and in the process, got to know the Neanderthals and Denisovans. We interbred with them, which is kind of extraordinary, and managed to get to Australia by about 50,000 years ago, which I find just mind-boggling. Is that roughly the right beginning of the story? Yeah, I'd say that's pretty close. Um, I would only add just a few details to that. Yeah, I would suggest yeah. there's so a lot of discussion right now is centered around dates and pushing these dates earlier and earlier and earlier. Um, but I would encourage people to consider thinking about anatomically modern Homo sapiens or humans mm -hmm. like us, right? Um, we abbreviate it as AMHS. Um, mm -hmm. So to think about AMHS as just one kind of several different kinds of humans that were around at the same time, I would say that the very fact that we interbred with Neanderthals and Denisovans shows that at least one of our def by at least one of our definitions of species that we're all mm -hmm. the same species. We're just yeah. different versions, different kinds of humans. And so I would say that, you know, yes, as you pointed out, we have these regional populations of archaic humans living in different parts of the world after Homo erectus leaves Africa, sometime after 2 million years ago. And then we have anatomically modern Homo sapiens emerges within the continent of Africa. And we have very strong evidence where from archaeology, genetics, and the fossil record showing this, but probably from multiple populations of humans that were in that region contributing, you know, different different features, right? And so sort of a mosaic kind of evolution that occurred. And then there were some early migrations out of Africa by these early anatomically modern Homo sapiens. They may have been leaving as early as perhaps Oh, gosh. Well, it's a bit controversial. <laughs> but we see the first anatomically modern humans between about 300 and 200,000 years ago. And then we see kind of these initial forays out of Africa, maybe as early as 250 to 150,000 years ago. But the main migration, the major migration mm -hmm. out of Africa of anatomically modern Homo sapiens is after about 70,000 years ago. And these mm -hmm. Humans p populated the earth, interbred with other kinds of archaic humans, and left their genetic legacies uh, in the rest of the world. Well, one of my favorite details of this, uh, the story of our, of our cousins, of other humans of different species, is the discovery of, of 
people on the island of Flores, which I think was another branch of Homo erectus, yeah. who evolved on this Indonesian island. Um, and of course, islands tend to produce dwarfism. And the people of Flores were, you know, three feet tall and change and hunted miniature elephants. Yeah, <laughs> right? it's which really a, extraordinary. It's, yeah. You just can't even, I mean, if somebody told you, you couldn't make this up. It's just... Yeah, I wish we had DNA from them. I really do. <laughs> it doesn't seem that the environment there is conducive to DNA preservation, but it would be really wonderful right. to be able to to understand what they look like genetically. Well, let's get to the meat of the story of your book, which is how it is that Homo sapiens came to the Americas. And I know I know there are competing theories. And you say in the book, just in the last 10 to 20 years, a mountain of new evidence has emerged what was the dominant story of the peopling of, of the Americas, say, let's say 20 years ago, and, and how has that changed? What's, what's the story that you believe to be true? So scientists once thought that the peopling of the Americas occurred pretty late, so around 13,000 years ago, give or take, but certainly after the last ice age, or what we call the last glacial maximum. I will probably refer to it periodically as the LGM. If I do that, yeah, this is what I'm referring to. In this model, a small group of people raced across the Bering Land Bridge or this connection, a land connection yep. that was in existence between Asia and North America. And they got to Alaska and the only route southward into the rest of the North American continent was this corridor that had opened up through this massive ice sheet that once blanketed North America, the northern parts of North America, I should say. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, at the end of the LGM, the last glacial maximum, you have global temperatures are slowly warming and this ice sheet, we, we know, began to melt. And routes through it for people to take began to open up. And, and in this model, people moved through an interior route that opened up along the Rocky Mountains in between these two massive glaciers. And they moved through what we call this ice-free corridor into the rest mm -hmm. of the Americas. And then they spread very, very quickly throughout North and South America because there were no other populations there to compete with, right? It was empty land. I mean, not empty, there were animals there and plants and so forth. But in this model, there are no other people that they have to deal with or compete with or interact with. And so they're able to rapidly spread throughout these continents. And they reach um, the southern part of South America very quickly, just a few thousand years. And they leave in the archaeological record a distinct a signature, which is this distinctive kind of spear point known as the mm -hmm. Clovis point, which is named after the Clovis, New Mexico. This all occurred about 13,000 years ago. Oh, and, and one corollary to this sometimes that people will add is perhaps they wiped out the megafauna that was dominating the American landscape at the end of the, the Ice Age, the giant mastodons, the cave bears, the um, glyptodons, all these wonderful, wonderful Ice Age creatures, which go extinct. And and there was a there's definite evidence that they were hunted with Clovis spear mm -hmm. points. And so the argument goes, perhaps they were wiped out by them. So that's the old story. <laughs> yeah. And, and this is the Clovis first model, you would now have a minority of archaeologists who would support this view. Yes, there are still a few archaeologists who do hold to this, but not very many. So what do you believe, Jennifer, is the most likely narrative? And I know there are a few out yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a complicated story, a complicated answer. Um, <laughs> so I will just start with saying we have archaeological evidence of people in the Americas much earlier than 13,000 years ago. The date at which you accept people being in the, in the Americas really depends on what kind of evidence that you prioritize. And, mm -hmm. you know, people may think, oh, it's really straightforward. You know, you've got an archaeological site, you date it. Oh, there you go. End of story. Why is this so controversial? It's actually quite a bit harder than that. And I don't think I really fully appreciated how difficult evaluating ancient sites were until I began working on this book and really grappling with these different sites, because a site, in order to be accepted as legitimate, has to pass a very stringent test. It's not just, I mean, if we find a human skeleton, for example, in a particular context and, and we can date it, okay, that's easy. But most of the time, for, for all these early sites, we don't have anything like that. So for all yeah. these early sites, it's a few flakes of rock or, you know, it, yeah. it, it may be a burned feature. Is that a hearth? Is it accidental burning? What is it? You know, trying to figure out 
how early people were in the Americas is not so simple. You can't just accept every claim. And each of them individually are almost litigated or debated yeah. among among experts, right? I remember, I mean, one, one that you referenced in the book is the Monde Verde site in Chile, mm -hmm. where archaeologists found ropes, wooden framed huts, remnants of meals, medicinal plants, and footprints. So this mm -hmm. seems clearly like a site, which was dated to 14,600 years ago, I think, right? Which would yes. clearly yes. Uh, conflict with the Clovis first model. Uh, is that broadly accepted or is there controversy there? I would say Monteverde is broadly accepted, yes, today. But there's another component at the site that dates to much earlier, much, much earlier, mm -hmm. like 20,000 years ago. I can't remember off the top of my head. And that, that one is much more controversial, right? Um, Monteverde, though, was instrumental. It was not the first mm -hmm. pre-Clovis site candidate, but it was the one that really became accepted by the majority of sort of big name archaeologists. And once that kind of, that broke the Clovis barrier and then, a lot of other sites which had been held up as candidates were then reevaluated and they, people were more open to accepting them. But a lot of probably legitimate pre-Clovis sites were dismissed before Monteverde. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of, it's really a shame. Um, again, it is hard though to, it is hard to persuade people when you have stringent levels of evidence, which I think is important. And we're going through something similar right now, right? We're, we're litigating many, many sites um, that have been held mm -hmm. up as different ages. And, and it's difficult to make sense of all of this. And again, that was a thing that a challenge that I had in writing this book is, as I'm not an archaeologist, right? To make sure that I treated the different perspectives on these different sites fairly. I talked to a lot of archaeologists and tried to get their takes. And I would say that not, I, you know, I, I kind of did an informal survey of archaeologists and I did not get the same list of which sites were acceptable from everybody. <laughs> they disagreed on different sites. Um, but I could say, broadly speaking, so we have a group of archaeologists that still maintains People arrived in the Americas rather late, so maybe just before 14,000 years ago. So it's similar to the Clovis first model. Another group of archaeologists on the absolute opposite extreme interprets the evidence as showing people were in the Americas very, very early, perhaps even as early as 130,000 years ago. That's a very small group of archaeologists. I would say that majority of archaeologists do not agree with that. The majority of archaeologists and geneticists look at the archaeological evidence, the totality of the archaeological record, and say, okay, looks like people were present in the Americas by about 15, 16, 17,000 years ago in that kind of time frame. Or perhaps, maybe some people were here as early as 25,000 years ago. And that really mm -hmm. depends on a couple of sites and whether or not you find those legitimate. Um, and that's kind of where the real excitement in archaeology is right now, I think. This 130,000-year-old camp, I uh, gather that there was a, a site in California, if I am remembering correctly, mm -hmm. that that produced a date to 130,000 years ago, which, as you say, most people are skeptical of. What would have to be true to have uh, uh, that scenario be borne out? I mean, what what kind of narrative would would possibly support that? Yeah, it's a tricky one, right? So if that site is legitimate evidence of human presence, and I would say most people, including myself, are pretty skeptical of that, but if it is, then it would have to be anatomically modern Homo sapiens, one of these really early populations that left Africa maybe in one of these early forays, like around 250 mm -hmm. to 150,000 years ago. I want to stress wow. we've seen no evidence of that migration taking place through Asia or anywhere else. So... We don't see the footprints of that migration, if that makes sense, into into the mm -hmm. Americas. If we did, you know, right. we would be that would be really cool, but we don't. And an alternative then, if it's not one of these anatomically modern Homo sapiens, really early ones, um, then it could be a Neanderthal or Denisovan or some other kind of archaic human that made this migration. You know, again, we don't see the footprints of that movement. We don't see any other sites that date to this time period in North America. Doesn't mean that they're not there, right? We have to be careful um, and look at the totality of the evidence, right? But there's always a first site to be found, right? <laughs> when you're doing when you're doing mm -hmm, research, um, mm -hmm. but but we don't see anything else corroborating this, um, and the genetics does not corroborate it either. Mm -hmm. And and this one, there were no human bones. This was just, if, if memory serves, a mastodon bashed yeah. in by a rock. Yes, it was um, 
a site that was excavated a while ago, and um, I believe the, the archaeologists, you know, I don't want to do them a disservice. You might want to uh, interview them, but I believe they went back to the museum where these materials had been stored and they examined them. And it was evidence of mastodon bones that had been fractured and some rocks that were kind of out of place, right? They weren't, they didn't fit mm, with the geology of the place. And so the scenario one could envision would be, okay, these rocks were brought here. They were actually tools and they were brought here by, mm, you know, early humans right. and used to bash these bones. There is a lot of things problematic with that, including the fact that, you know, there were construction equipment in the area. They may have broken the bones and, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of stuff. So, but I, you know, I'm confident if this is true, if there were people here, we'll find more evidence of them. We have not yet, but, right. you know, we have to leave open to the possibility, even if it's unlikely. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, and there is this pattern of dates getting pushed back further and further. I mean, that, that does seem to be the story of the journey we've been on in this, this journey of discovery. Um, so continuing with the Jennifer Raff, most probable description of the peopling of the Americas. So I, I guess it begins in, in, in Siberia um, mm -hmm. uh, about 30,000 years ago. Yeah. So we're looking at these early, early upper paleolithic populations in Siberia, right? And this is where genetics has really helped because genetics allows us to identify populations that may have been ancestral, that were, I shouldn't say may have, it's pretty, pretty clear at this point from genetics, were ancestral to what I, I'm calling them the first peoples, right? The first peoples who are ancestral to indigenous, indigenous peoples of the Americas. And what genetics shows us is that the population that gives rise to the first peoples was itself descended from an isolated group of East Asians in the Upper Paleolithic, and then another group we call the ancient North Siberians. And these two populations meet each other about 25,000 years ago, give or take. <laughs> and their descendants then become isolated for several thousands, several thousand years. And it's that isol period of isolation that allows for genetic variants to um, appear and for population splitting events to occur without any contact with any other outside population. That's where the formation of the gene pool of the first peoples it takes place right about then. So um, between about 26, 20,000 years ago, we're still you know, arguing about how long this isolation was. It may just have been a few thousand years. It's hard to say. Um, but it coincides with the peak of this global climate event, which we call the last glacial mm, maximum. Yeah. So mm -hmm. all around the world, in the Northern Hemisphere especially, we're seeing bitterly cold and arid conditions and glacial ice masses are then forming. And, and this period is the peak of it. Uh, it would have been a very difficult period in which to live. And we see globally human populations moving to different regions, to refugia where they can, you know, find access mm -hmm. to water and to plants and animals and survive. And this is one of the key periods in human history, right? Human evolutionary history. This is really important during this period. And we think, perhaps, I, I find it most compelling anyway, the model that says that during this time, this ancestral population of Native Americans is also in a refugium. That's why they're isolated, right? Um, mm -hmm. And we don't know where exactly, right? So geography is always hard to get at with genetics. Um, <laughs> but one candidate is in what, what we would call the Bering Land Bridge itself. So the southern margin mm -hmm. of that land connection of the broader um, geographic region called Beringia, the southern margin in the center of it, which is, of course, underwater today, but back then would have been a relatively decent place to live, much better than other places around um, Northern Asia and, and Siberia. It would have been warmer and wetter because of the presence of ocean currents on the coast. And paleo environmental reconstructions have shown that there were um, plants there. <laughs> there were there was certainly like fish and marine resources and you know waterfowl and all sorts of, of critters that would have been there and available for people to subsist on. You say paleo environmental reconstructions, and of course that uh, really excites all my my geeky impulses. <laughs> Is it? I mean, are these computer models? How how do they generate? Yeah, this, well, know? it's really interesting. So these amazing scientists are going around. They're taking cores in the in the ocean and and coring down, and then they get you know pull them up, and they've got 
all the sediments, right, all the layers there, and they can look and they can look for various kinds of evidence that shows them what would have been there and what the temperatures would have been like. So, for example, you know, the presence of insect remains, insect mm-hmm. fossils, right? Those will tell you, okay, at, in the summer of this period, it was this kind of temperature, right? Because these insects can only survive in this kind of climate. Uh, similar with plants, they can they can reconstruct what kinds of plants were there from um, pollen, they can get pollen out and look at the under a microscope and, and figure out what kind of plants they belong to. So it's really extraordinary. And then, of course, yeah, they put this all into uh, extremely complex computer models that I don't understand and can reconstruct these uh, these environments. It's it's really fascinating. Wow. And and another another layer of the story I can't resist adding here. One of the most fascinating little, little details in the book to me was our co-evolution with dogs. Oh, yes. <laughs> right. And this discovery that actually American dogs did not evolve from American wolves. And, we, and through genetics, we can see this. They instead evolved from Siberian wolves, right? And so presumably came with these peoples. And I think you suggest that in this time of isolation and what might have been this southern Beringia refugia area, this might have been a time when the humans and dogs sort of co-evolved, like a, a critical period in that story. Yes, and it's... One of the most exciting um, developments, I think, in this field that I've seen in a long time. I'm so excited about this paper. Um, what they did was something very clever. They looked at mitochondrial lineages, and and just to I don't know if people know what mitochondria are, but you know the mm-hmm. the little powerhouse organelle in your cells have their own separate genomes, and they're strictly maternally inherited. And mitochondrial um, genomes can give us a, a way of reconstructing uh, history just through the maternal lineages. So they're they're somewhat limited in that regard, but they're also very powerful tools for understanding evolutionary history. Um, and so they looked at dog mitochondrial genomes, including some ancient dogs, and were able mm-hmm. to reconstruct the splitting patterns of these lineages and in correlating them with um, the molecular clock or how fast DNA mutates, right? You can work backwards and figure out when two lineages last shared a common ancestor. And they were able to identify the major estimates of the major, the timing of these lineage, lineages splitting. And they correlate beautifully with human population splits in the Americas. It's really, really fascinating. Wow. So some dog so lineages cool. you see only in Northeast Asia, some you see in North America, and the timing of these splits matches pretty well the timing of what we think of human population splits are. So it's extraordinary. Jennifer, this is making me think we may have to give into our, our children's insistence that we get a dog. Oh, you have to get a dog. <laughs> Everybody the, should have a dog. Don't you think? One. Right. Yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> right. Definitely. I support this. The, the, <laughs> the, uh, I mean, there's a very long history we have. as Yes, you know, it's important. You know, with the dog. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jonathan Fields. Tune into my podcast for conversations about the sweet spot between work, meaning, and joy. And also listen to other people's questions about how to get the most out of that thing we call work. Check out Spark wherever you enjoy podcasts. Hey folks, Rufus here. If you're a fan of our interviews with physicians, scientists, or entrepreneurs, then I have the perfect podcast recommendation for you, Raising Health. Previously called BioEats World, Raising Health comes from the leading venture capital firm, Andreessen Horowitz, A16Z. Each episode, Raising Health dives deep into the heart of healthcare, biotech, and AI with A16Z general partners. Along the way, they explore the real challenges and opportunities in health and biotech entrepreneurship. Not to mention, you'll hear raw insights and actionable advice from notable guests like Omada CEO and co-founder Sean Duffy and AI expert and in Citro CEO Daphne Kohler. Don't miss out. Follow Raising Health wherever you get your podcasts. So here we are in this uh, refugia in, in southern Beringia, waiting for the, the, the last glacial migration to uh, recede, I guess. Yeah. So many geneticists and archaeologists believe that the ancestors of the first peoples were living in the vicinity of the southern coast of central Beringia. And, and that was really, it was at this time, it was a land connection twice the size of Texas. And so during the last glacial maximum, I like to think of this not as 
a bridge in the sense that people could race across it to move from one continent to the other, but instead a homeland. Because the southern coast of Central Beringia would have been a, a relatively decent place to live. What genetics shows us is that during a period of isolation, so between about 22,000 and 18,000 years ago, several branches um, emerged within this ancestral population. One of these branches gives rise to the first people south of the ice sheets. So what genetics shows us is that these ancestral Native Americans moved southward and they split into several branches along the way, likely traveling along the West Coast by boat starting around 17,000 years ago. And so that makes a much more plausible route for people to be taking to get to places like Cactus Hill site in Virginia about 16,000 years ago, 15,000 years mm -hmm. ago, or maybe the Buttermilk Creek complex sites in Texas, which are like 15,000 years ago, right? So, you know, you have to have people moving in pretty early. And yeah. so I think that coastal route is much more likely. Um, and we know that people, we don't have direct evidence of people with boats, but we're pretty, we have pretty good indirect evidence that people had boats by then. Oh, so that's interesting, right? Because we don't have an archaeological record of boats. No. We we know that other peoples navigated to Australia as long as 50,000 years yeah. ago. So it's certainly it's certainly entirely possible. We also know that I guess a lot of what would have been the coast is now underwater so that the archaeological record would be hard to see. What do we have any indirect evidence of of like maritime navigation or yeah, we have kind of two 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 pieces of evidence there. So one of them is the rapidity at which with which people's genomes diverged and moved, right? right so right. if you you can do all sorts of really fancy things with genomics, and one of the models that you can do um, can give you insights into how fast people were moving indirectly from how fast their lineages were were diverging from each other, right? Because if you've got two people separated by great geographic distance, but they're still fairly closely related, right? That suggests that they haven't been separated for very long. And one of the really striking pieces of evidence there is if you look at a genome of the child from Montana, known as ANZIG, the, the oldest genome in, in the Americas, which dates to, oh gosh, what is this date? 12,600 years ago. And then another very closely, very shortly thereafter, an, another uh, genome, a, a lineage in um Brazil at the Lagoa Santa site, right? They're on the same branch, the same genetic branch, same lineage, right? Very, very closely related. And that's a big geographic distance, right? Crossing from Montana to Brazil by foot at the, during this period, even let's say you were taking rivers or something, it would have been very difficult to do that quickly. So this suggests a very, very rapid migration. Um, and by boat along the coast is probably the most feasible way to get from Montana to Brazil in that, that amount of time. And, and so there's this moment that, you know, some concentration of first peoples make it down to North America. And we, we I guess the preponderance of evidence would, would suggest uh, along the coast and probably by boat. And then there's this population explosion. I think you write that it's it was a 60-fold increase in population between 13,000 and 16,000 years ago. Yeah. Uh, right, and that's that's in the genetic record. Yeah, yeah, we can especially see that in mitochondrial DNA. Yeah, it's people are moving across the landscape, spreading out, having babies, and populations are adapting to their environments. This is what uh, a lot archaeologists will um, call settling in. Right, they're they're learning where resources are in a particular geographic area. They're developing relationships with the land and with the you know non-human organisms who live there and. They're still at this point very, very mobile. So people are spreading around wide swaths of territory, right? But it's really fascinating to me to see kind of the genetic record of that. It's it's really, really striking. Well, and, and you write in the book, this population explosion is exactly what we'd expect to see in the genetic record when people move into new territories where resources are far less limited, there's no competition from other people, and the game animals have no natural fear of humans, having never seen them before. So so this is kind of a, a, a bit of a golden age, right? I mean, you've got this sort of human-friendly landscape with lots of uh, these extraordinary megafauna, these roaming enormous bison and 
mastodons and are, are there giant sloths like what yes <laughs> giant what, what was this landscape like could you describe I mean, what dire this was like? wolves dire wolves were real creatures and they were in north america yeah i mean just extraordinary you know i think though you know having heard you read that part i you know i think i might edit myself i am um, well i was just at a conference the society for american archaeology conference and i was just in a session about the white sands site which i think we should oh, talk yes. about yes i don't know when yes, you want to talk yes. about it but <laughs> let's get uh, into oh it's fascinating yeah yes and one of the pieces of evidence that i took away from this site and in listening to some of the archaeologists talk about it is how the animals are reacting to humans uh, which we mm -hmm. can tell from their footprints, which I'll I'll talk about in a minute. Oh, interesting. But they're describing wow. these giant sloths coming across a footprint trail left by humans. And you can see the sloth, uh, this is extraordinary, standing up on their hind legs, shuffling around on the ground, and then dropping back down and changing directions away from the, the direction the humans are going. So, I mean, I, I'm going to wow. amend my my imagination of this sort of idyllic paradise of the animals not knowing that humans are a uh, threat, because <laughs> right, clearly right, right, they right. know, right? And, I, you know, that's just my own naivete here to imagining that. But, uh, yeah, it's pretty amazing. So let's talk about White Sands, which you brought up. So this is a recent discovery in New Mexico, if I remember correctly, that is just extraordinary. And I had to pull up online photos. I would encourage listeners to pull up photos of the White Sands footprints, uh, right? Because because they're, they're these extraordinary footprints of, of humans, adults and children's, and mastodons, and I guess you just mentioned sloths perhaps as well, and and there's this incredible detail, an, an adult putting a child down that they've been carrying who walks a small distance and children playing. And it's almost like a postcard from another moment in history. I mean, do you do you find yourself feeling kind of emotionally moved uh, yeah. <laughs> when you encounter these discoveries? Do, do, do you feel a kinship with these first peoples? Well, it's hard not to see these footprints and and you know, not feel, I mean, I, the, I knew about this site for a while. Um, I knew it was coming, you know, I was kind of freaking out about how was I going to get it into my book, right? <laughs> so, because it really came out like late 2021. And that was like when my final manuscript was due. And um, luckily, the authors kindly let me look at, you know, an advanced copy. And I, I really appreciate that they, they did that. So the, these footprints, it's its extraordinary. These footprints um, span like 2,000 years of sediments and have been dated wow. to between about 20, 23,000 years ago. So let's talk about what that means for our models here in a minute. But like even knowing this and thinking, okay, this is a game changer and everything in my book could be wrong. Um, <laughs> even knowing that and, you know, it wasn't until I, I opened up a picture of these footprints. I finally got it and I opened it up and I was just like, oh my God, I actually, I think I teared up a little bit. I mean, it's mm. extraordinary. These footprints are, as you say, a postcard from the past and it's a postcard that spans, you know, kilometers and, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, many, many geological layers, like 2000 years of, of, of people moving around at this site in the mud, like walking in the mud and leaving these footprints. And there's absolutely no question that they are late Pleistocene. And by the way, the Pleistocene, this was was up until about 12,000 years ago. Is that right? Yeah, give or take. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of archaeologists have, are skeptical, of course, naturally, by this extraordinary claim of, you know, these very, very early dates that predate, you know, all of the mainly accepted sites in the Americas. And in fact, people would have had to have come to the Americas before the start of the last glacial maximum. Because after wow. about 25,000 years ago, there was no way to really get past the ice sheet unless we're missing something. And so it would have been a very early migration about 25,000 years ago, maybe a bit earlier than that, which is, you know, unlike Ceru the Ceruti Mastodon site, this 130,000 year old site, it was plausible. There were people in anatomically modern Homo sapiens in northern Siberia by 30,000, 32,000 years ago. So it could have happened. Mm -hmm. We can mm -hmm. see kind of that, that, that breadcrumb trail there, right? If that's how it worked. But, you know, people being here that early doesn't really, on its surface, match the archaeological record or match the, the genetic record that we see. And mm -hmm. so we're trying mm -hmm. to grapple with that and figure out, okay, in what ways are our models wrong or what are we missing here? If this is true, because I got a caveat that archaeologists, a lot of archaeologists are very skeptical of this. 
So I was in this this um, this session at the SAAs, and you know, I, I was lucky enough to be a discussant to get to talk about genetics in that context. And but I was listening before my talk to a bunch of archaeologists who were working at the site, and and they were talking about all sorts of things like how they were. Um, how they were working on the site with local tribes and pueblos to make sure that you know protocols were followed and that the research was respectful um, and done in the ways that they wanted to see it done. Um, mm -hmm. But they were also describing the dating of these yeah. footprints and how do you date footprints that are you know it, it's very difficult. But one of the most significant pieces of evidence that shows that these really are quite old is that these human footprints sometimes you know a mastodon comes along and steps on the mud right on top of a human footprint, right? It's that you have them co-occurring. It's There's no question that there's an association here. Hopefully the human got out of the way before well, that Well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it is so fascinating. So one of the things I found most striking from this session was just hearing about um, the behavior that they're able to infer mm -hmm. from these footprints. So people are walking. Oh. And as you say, like the longest stretch of footprints is a, it's a, a small person, maybe a teenager, maybe a, a small young woman, who knows, it could have been a small man, walking across this landscape for a very long way, like a kilometer almost, and wow. carrying a child and then putting the child down. The child walks for a little bit and then picking the child up again. I mean, it's just amazing. Mm -hmm. And these animals and how they interact with humans. So, you know, the mastodons don't care about the humans. They come across the human footprint. They just keep going. <laughs> they don't care. But they were describing right. the sloth, the behavior of the wow. sloths, and how they Amazing. shuffle around. And they're clearly looking for the humans, right? And, and, and it definitely alters their behavior when they come across human footprints. So just wow. extraordinary. And so this could be, this may or may not be the beginning of a sequence of discoveries that cause us to have to redate the migration again, right? I mean, we don't, right now, it sounds like there's not a preponderance of evidence, but this is precisely what happened with the series of sites that eventually led to the refutation of the Clovis first hypothesis, right? That we, yes. we used to think that, right, that we were coming down, you know, 10 to 12,000 years ago and then had first one site, then a second site, then a third site, right? And this preponderance of evidence pushed us to say, hey, wait a second, this is no longer, this is now too much evidence that we were here earlier. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, one of the things that I went through in my book, and one of the reasons it took my, me so long to write this book was, you know, I also thought it's really important to capture the history of archaeology as much as I can, mm, yeah. neither being a historian nor an archaeologist, but to talk about these cycles, because Really, there have been a number of paradigm shifts in the history of archaeology in this region and the, and the history of archaeological thinking on the origins of the First Peoples. And, you know, we can go back to the Clovis First idea, but we can also go back earlier than that to the early 1900s when people were arguing about whether or not Native Americans were here 5,000 years ago or earlier than 5,000 years ago, right? Uh, and even earlier than that, um, the arguments in the 19th century and even predating that about were um, the first peoples of the Americas actually the ancestors of Native Americans or were they Europeans or, or from some other place, right? Um, regrettably, that argument is still going on um, in some circles. I really hate that. Um, but yeah, there, there have been these constant paradigm shifts in the history of archaeology. And I you know, it's tempting to imagine that we might be on the verge of another one, right, with this this discovery, because there is no question that there are humans, that these are human footprints, they are humans. Uh, and then the question is, how do you interpret them? How old are they? And then how do we account for this population of people here in what's present day New Mexico, without, you know, solid evidence in other places? There are other sites that are, are purporting to date from this period, but so far they have not been convincingly demonstrated to the majority of archaeologists as being evidence of humans there. They're, you know, flakes of stone, right? May or may not be tools or, you know. Um, this this definitely is humans, though. This, there's no question about that. So, you know, what do we do? What are we missing? What do we need to look for? How can we understand this in light of the genetic evidence that maybe shows us something different? And that's where you can get into some of the really fascinating topics in genetics that show us maybe there's some answers in some of the kind of oddities that that genetics has has revealed in the last few years. Mm -hmm. Well, and and you you say at one point that um, it's a personal struggle for you, and I imagine for many experts in the field, to not get too married to your models, 
Yes, it is. I mean, there are there are times where I've been tempted, right? So, you know, this finding of this, um, you know, very unusual signature, genetic signature, an association, genetic association between some South Americans and Australasians, right? And, you know, how do we interpret that? Um, it's very tempting to say, oh, of course, there was a migration across the ocean by seafarers from, you know, but actually, no, the genetics does not match that pattern that we would expect. It shows a much older history there. And so how do we account for that and trying to come up with models that would account for that um, has been has been a struggle in trying to figure this out. One of the things that I'm trying not to become wedded to, <laughs> but keep open as a possibility is that perhaps this signature is, is um, a reflection of maybe earlier people in the Americas that are like at sites like White Sands, right? And that do give ancestry to present day Native Americans, but you know they came here a bit earlier than that main migration. So that's one interpretation. I kind of like it, but I'm trying not mm -hmm. to be, you know, not to be wedded to it just because I could be wrong and uh, it could be something completely else, different. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that well, that is that is exciting as a possibility. Would you like to be the most interesting person at your next cocktail party? Want to be the person who always has a great answer to the question, read any good books lately? Want to get smarter without cutting into your precious Netflix binge time? Well, allow me to introduce you to the next Big Idea app. Our curators, Malcolm Gladwell, Adam Grant, Susan Cain, and Daniel Pink, have handpicked hundreds of the best new books, and we've worked directly with the authors of those books to create 12-minute audio summaries. Unlike other book summary apps, these aren't written by side-hustling college students. They're written and read by the authors themselves. And that's not all you'll find once you download the app. We also have masterclasses from authors like Shankar Vedantam and Lisa Feldman Barrett, ad-free versions of this podcast, and exclusive author interviews you can't find anywhere else. There is no better way to get smart fast. Download the Next Big Idea app today by going to your app store and searching for Next Big Idea. You know, so one form of emotional investment is in one's models. Another form is in imagining what it was like to to be part of these first peoples, which I, I have to think that any most all experts in the field, it's part of why you're in the field, right? Is because it's just so extraordinary to imagine this. And it really comes out in these vignettes that you share, which, and, and if you don't mind, I think I might read one of them, a really beautiful passage here. Imagine living in Eastern Beringia during the Pleistocene. You and your band, a group of several extended families, follow a way of life that your ancestors did for many generations. It is summer and you make your home close to the river where you can hunt waterfowl and fish and feast on the berries and other delicious plants that grow in the valley. The hunters in your family spend their days stockpiling precious stone from nearby outcroppings, knowing it will be much harder to find good tool stone at your winter home many weeks travel from here. Late afternoons around the camp are punctuated by the sharp report of rocks striking each other as the hunters, and the children who imitate them shape the rocks they've collected into lighter, more portable forms that they could use later in the year to quickly replace the tiny blades on knives and spears. One of the hunters is taking time off to recover from childbirth. A young teenager who's gotten good at making tools has been selected to replace her in this essential task. This afternoon, he sits proudly with the other toolmakers, the envy of the younger children who redouble their clumsier efforts to work the less valuable practice stones. Laughter and song fill the air, the barking of the dogs at some imaginary threat, and good-natured arguments about who the newborn most resembles compete with the squabbles of the young toolmakers over who gets to sit closest to the hunters and watch them. The children are excitedly planning an expedition to see the ice wall several days' walk from your camp. Some of the older members of the group have agreed to shepherd them. It will be an important chance to teach them and give their parents a bit of a break. What an extraordinary scene. And imagining that ice wall is equally extraordinary. I love this description. You write, 
Imagine living in close proximity to a wall of ice six times taller than the Willis Tower in Chicago. At its peak, nearly two miles thick, this wall would have been far taller and more impermeable than the wall from Game of Thrones. It would extend to the east and the west as far as you or anyone you know has ever traveled. So Jennifer, this process of imagining how First Peoples actually lived on a daily basis, do you see this as part of the job of writing this book or is it part of the job of being a specialist in this area? Oh, thank you. Again, nobody's ever asked me that before. Um, I think it was initially part of the job of writing the book and it has, you know, since I started writing in that way, I have uh, tried to do more of it, more of this imagining. I, you know, I have to... I, I wasn't sure if it was going to work when I wrote these. It was a bit of a gamble for me because I don't know. They're very fanciful, right? Um, and mm -hmm, and and sure. I, I'm sure you can tell um, that I was very much informed by being a parent of a young child in writing yeah, these. Yeah. Not just this one, but also, uh, unfortunately, you know, there's a lot of the genomes that we um, we have come from the remains of children who were buried, young mm, children. Sure. And yeah. man, I, I sometimes writing parts of these, this book was really tough, right? Because I wrote yeah. it while my son was growing up from a, from a newborn to he's mm. four now. But I tried to use that, you know, feeling that, uh, that emotion to, to, to inform these um, and to put myself in the place of the parents who would have been burying their children. Um, but there, it's tricky because I am, you know, a, a white, settler scientist, right? Writing about the lives of, of people who are ancestral, not my ancestors, ancestral to indigenous peoples. And um, I was very concerned about overstepping or being culturally insensitive as I wrote these things. Um, and so I am, um, I, you know, it was, it was difficult to write them, but even more difficult, I think maybe to publish them because I, I was worried a lot about, about how this would how this would be interpreted or, or whether I transgress in any way. But I was, I was lucky because I had some really wonderful um, sensitivity editors who, who read through everything mm, I wrote great. and gave me feedback. And that was extremely helpful, including one who told me from that particular passage, she's like, yeah, I mean, my ancestors come from this particular region and, you know, some, you know, I like to eat traditional foods, but really, you know, some of them I just don't like. <laughs> Which is really funny. Like, <laughs> right. Yeah. Right, so. right, right. This other she loves, but yeah, she's like, when I was talking about the delicious berries, I think she's like, eh, you know, some of them are good. <laughs> and and you had, and you had one woman say that, uh, at, at some point, I think, why are you so interested in me? Oh, Why yes. are you so interested in yes, us? Yes, why right? are you so obsessed with me? She was channeling Mariah Carey, like that song, you know? Okay. Yeah, and, and well, and it was, she was making a really important point, which is that here we white European descended settler scientists, right, are coming in and, and we have this long history of ever since settlers first got to the Americas of trying to understand who Native Americans are. And in the initial questioning about this, the very first settlers were like, well, they're not in the Bible. So, you know, this is very upsetting yeah. to them, right? Yeah. Um, and the history of our fields in asking these questions has been really bad, like extremely exploitive. Yeah grave robbing, taking skeletons, ancestor skeletons, and putting them into museums to study, but then not returning them when, when asked, not getting permission, treating um, them like specimens rather than uh, ancestral remains. And, you know, it, it, I could go on and on. I mean, I, I go through a lot of this in the book because I think mm, that yeah. one of the most important lessons from this period of time in the history and studying the history of, of indigenous peoples is understanding you really need to understand the the history of how we have studied them and we being, you know, uh, white settler scientists like me, because it's deeply rooted in colonialism. It's deeply rooted in centuries of exploitation of indigenous peoples and what results that we obtain from our research today have the potential to deeply impact native communities. And so I really believe mm -hmm. we can choose to do this research in a positive way, but we need to have an understanding of the ways in which previous work has harmed Native Americans, but also mm -hmm. the ways in which good work has been done. And and so I've tried to put examples of both into my book. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And well, and and you you do a great job of describing this kind of incredulousness that existed both in the early American colonists and even today, you see it on television specials, 
that say, well, there must be some other explanation for the technological sophistication of these people. They must have been descended from Europeans. They must have been, you know, come from outer space. <laughs> they must have been aliens or some of them. Other. And, and that that is inherently a kind of a kind of racist impulse. Yeah. And 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 you've made a, a done a great job in this book of of kind of trying to offset uh, that that history. I think. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, I just it, it's. It drives me absolutely bonkers when people are like, oh, scientists are trying to suppress the true history and, you know, it's, you know, whatever it is, aliens or giants or, you know, Europeans or Atlanteans, whatever it is, right? Anybody other than the ancestors of Native Americans, it becomes part of this mythology. And and I'm not sure that people realize that this mythology has deep, deep roots all the way back mm -hmm. to yeah. these very first European settlers and that it's this mythology which was used as an explicit justification for the Indian Removal Act, which caused the Trail of Tears. Andrew Jackson cites the myth of the mound builder, as we call it, as as evidence mm, for why wow. the, the yeah it's it's really um, it's really upsetting, and disturbing, and I think it's a history that everybody needs to know. So continuing the story, so so we have this massive population of North America, South America, and. What do we think was the was the sort of maximum population? It was just just astounding. I'll never forget reading 1491 by Charles Mann. I don't uh -huh. know if you ever read those books. Oh yes, wonderful and, book. Yeah, mm -hmm. and these incredible descriptions by early the earliest European navigators of sailing up the East Coast and seeing so many fires at night so close together that it looked like the entire East Coast of the United States was a single village. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, there was just an, a, a massive population. How long does that story go? Oh, well, I was kind of hoping you wouldn't ask me about population numbers because I don't really know. I don't think we uh, know. Um, I yeah. think, you know, and part of the problem is that the devastation that was wrought by colonialism, right, and yeah. the impacts of diseases on indigenous populations caused a population crash. And we see this again and again. It hasn't been, I think, genetically studied as well as it could be. And that's something that I try to do with my own research. But um, the impacts of European colonization on, on native populations and, and how does that affect them genetically, there has been some work done. It's hard to extrapolate, though, because... Um, there are, well, there's a lot of complicating factors and in one can't necessarily say, okay, I look at this population in this region and I can infer from that, you know, what I can work backwards and use that for to, to make estimates across the entire continents, right? One can't really do that accurately, I don't think. Certainly though, millions and millions and millions of people, right, were, were, were present. Um, the exact number though, I'm going to have to punt on that question. I'm not sure I could answer. Maybe a historian yeah, sure, could, I think. Sure, sure, yeah, right, yeah. right. But millions, this is an, oh, yeah. an extraordinary oh, yeah. number. Yeah. And, and, and then towards the end of the book, when you're describing the last part of the sort of migratory patterns, that I think the last areas to be peopled were these Caribbean islands from South America, I guess, right? And and then the Arctic. Yeah, right? yeah, both really fascinating stories. Um, I learned about the peopling of the Caribbean much more recently. So, I, you know, my knowledge of that is less, um, I would say, is, is more informed by my colleagues' work. But uh, yeah, it was a much more recent um, peopling event, as far as we can tell from both archaeology and genetics. Um, and then also the peopling of the Arctic, which I do know a bit more about, um, having worked up there for a number of years. And I see these as part of the initial peopling of the Americas, even though they were occurring much, much more recently, you know, in the case of the Arctic, the first migrations were about 5,000 years ago, and then um, followed by another big migration about 800 years ago of the ancestors of present day Arctic peoples. You know, one would say, oh, that's much more recent, right? Is that really part of the initial peopling? But I see it as part of that, um, that process. So I wanted to include them in the book as well. Well, I, I I love that you see five thousand years ago as as recent. It's all a matter of perspective. <laughs> but when you think about it in terms of in terms of European history, right? I mean that that's a, a, a quite quite a while ago. And the idea that 
that the the Caribbean Sea had so much uh, boat navigation during this period, several thousand years ago, that I think one expert referred to it as an aquatic motorway. Yes, I love right? that. Because there was so much, yeah. so yeah. much transit. So there's just an incredible kind of uh, sophisticated set of cultures that are that are that are migrating in, in this, these more recent years. I, I, I find this. I don't know if you saw this this article in the New York Times Magazine. Some. I think it was in 2016 about the art of wave piloting. Oh, no, I, I missed um, that. <laughs> and oh, it's just incredible that when you try to understand how people navigated the Polynesian islands and eventually made it to Hawaii and so on, that there was this sort of ancient um, skill of reading the waves and, uh, and, and being able to read incredibly subtle nuances in the waves in order to see basically the the bounce back of islands hundreds of miles away and that there was it passed down generation to generation this incredible capacity for wave piloting but i i just find myself in awe of kind of the when we think about just sort of the intelligence of these people you know tens of thousands of years ago and what they were able to do and how difficult it would have been for for you or me i mean if you if you were to take the two of us jennifer oh. <laughs> or a, a, a collection of our friends and put us out of the in, in the woods and try to do any of these things it's just is so daunting oh i would be uh, so i would it's hard I would die it's hard not to have <laughs> yes I, right i do not have these skills <laughs> we're, we're and terrible. i you know i have yeah. tried to make stone tools i'm terrible at it i i just have nothing but respect yeah. for people who can who can do that yeah well, um, Jennifer, thank you so much for your time today. I, I think the uh, I think your book is just is just it, it's it's fascinating. I think it does a beautiful job of of honoring the um, the history of the first peoples and their descendants. And and I, I also feel on this kind of broad human level that you know you you hear these descriptions of astronauts looking out the window and seeing this this singular blue planet and with no dividing lines and no boundaries and, and and feeling this sort of kinship with all humans. And I, I feel that in in studying sort of the ancient human history somehow. It, it, to me, it's sort of a, uh, there's a, there's a feeling of just sort of the miracle of, of the species being existing at all is, is uh, somehow makes me feel more connected. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Jennifer Raff's new book is Origin, A Genetic History of the Americas. You will find it wherever books are sold. If you enjoyed this episode, check out my conversation with David Wengro. Among my favorites, it's called Dawn of Everything, The True History of Humanity. If you want the short version, you can download the Next Big Idea app and check out David's book bite. This is a 12-minute audio summary of the book written and read by David himself. It's a fantastic listen. Search for Next Big Idea in your app store. If you like this show, please leave us a rating and a review. If you don't like the show, please write your thoughts down on a piece of paper, fashion it into a boat, and set it off across the Bering Strait. Follow us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, the Next Big Idea app, or wherever you're listening right now. This episode was written, edited, and produced by Caleb Bissinger. Our executive producer and snooty professor voice in the intro is Michael Kavnat. Sound designed by Mike Toda. We'd be happy to be dropped off in the woods with the team from LinkedIn, and we'd be more likely to survive thanks to their presence. I'm your host, Rufus Griscom. See you next week.